We have a ministry in this church called Visitation. And what Visitation does, it's really incorporated into a number of ministries like the prison ministry. They make visits to a prison and they see an inmate. I'm trying to find a way now um, by the grace of God to get the singers and myself down to this uh, main penitentiary in um, Mississippi, in a very poor part of Mississippi. I've been there once, but I wanna make a visit there and bring music and preach the gospel to more than uh, 2,300 inmates. Uh, visitation ministry includes like going to someone's house who's a shut-in and you visit them and that visit can change their life and give them a lift. And then they make visits to shelters. And we're going here in a couple months. Um, I'm going down with the singers. We're gonna visit the Atlantic Armory shelter there on Atlantic and Bedford. And uh, visits are, are a good thing. Uh, what many people don't know about, and it's not part of most concepts of Christianity, is the importance of when God makes a visit. Now God is omnipresent, which means God is everywhere at all times. But in another sense, the Bible tells us that God makes visits. He visits his people, not just individually, but most importantly, corporately when they gather together. And that's what I wanna talk to you about briefly because we're gonna sing and pray and end the meeting uh, in response to what we're gonna learn. We wanna talk about divine or visitations of God. So let me read about a famous one, obviously, when the church began. Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the stories are told in those gospel narratives, how he was born of a virgin, and at about 30 years old, he began his public ministry by being baptized, and then for three and a half years, he had gathered 12 disciples and he had others, but 12 close ones who he traveled with, all leading up to the point where he went for his last time to Jerusalem. And there they had plotted to take his life. They were jealous of him, his, the blessing of God on him and the people following him, the religious leaders couldn't take that. So they plotted to murder him. He died on a cross, but God was working out his purpose for us, wasn't he? He died for our sins. That blood that was shed has washed away all of our sins. There's no record in heaven of any sin any of us have ever committed, not because we didn't commit them, but because God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's Old Testament. Imagine the blood, not of goats and lambs, but the blood of his own son, Jesus Christ. How many are free from all guilt and condemnation? Come on, let's, let's affirm that. Thank God for it. So he rose again from the dead on the third day, and then for about 40 days, he saw his disciples off and on. It's a mysterious part of the New Testament. He could hide who he was somehow from them, but then he would just appear, walls, doors, didn't matter, and he would talk to them about the kingdom. So uh, in, before he ascended to heaven in Acts chapter one, we find these verses. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem. Hey, that was tough because Jerusalem is where they killed him. Jerusalem was the center of the opposition. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized, that's John the Baptist, with water. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus never baptized anyone physically. He had his disciples do that. As John's ministry waned and ended up in prison and then he was martyred, uh, Jesus uh, drew greater crowds. People were baptized as a sign of their repentance. But Jesus never put them in the water. Disciples did because he had this other baptism that was designated for him by the Father. They then gathered around him, then they gathered around him and asked 
him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Uh, he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That's a visitation of God. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, north of Judea, the province, and to the ends of the earth. So the disciples got into a he was trying to talk about the, what's most important, and they got into a prophecy question. Are you going to restore this now, and what's going to happen in Israel, and all that? And Jesus said a good word to all of us. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons that God is going to work everything out. You know, there's so many books on prophecy and pro prophetic conferences that sometimes people can get carried away and get into all mysterious things and predictions and when Jesus return and the mark of the beast and Israel and this and that, and they forget the main thing is the main thing. And the main thing is this, you'll receive power and you're going to go out and be witnesses and you're going to win people to me and get them in my kingdom. Let God figure it out at the end. Amen. We don't have to argue and talk about that too much. It's, it's in the Bible. We can study it. Obviously, honest Christians disagree about a lot of that in terms of the prophetic chart and all that. But uh, he said, no, you go back to Jerusalem and you wait. You've been with me three and a half years, but you're not ready to do what I need you to do. So go and wait. And they waited off and on there for about 10 days. So let's just think, though, the context of this. Who were those people Jesus was talking to? Well, at the very first part there where I read, there were 11 disciples because Judas had taken his life after betraying Jesus. So imagine the fear that was in them when they heard Jesus said, you go back to Jerusalem. No, how about let's get out of town? No, you go back to Jerusalem, but that's where they killed you. That's where the opposition is. And if they killed you with your mighty power, what are they gonna do to us? So imagine, let's be, get the human equation. They were really filled with fear, apprehension. Uh, what's gonna happen to them? Everybody cares about their life. Peter was married, we know that. Jesus healed his mother-in-law and so on and so forth. So number two, they were filled with guilt and condemnation. Why? Because all of them fled after Jesus was arrested. We focus on Peter because it's famous that he followed Jesus, but from afar after he was arrested, he ended up in the courtyard and the fake trial was going on, and, and, and he, he denied three times that he even knew who the Lord was, and he cursed the third time when he did it. But when Jesus was arrested in the garden, they all fled. Now, let me get that. They had been with him three and a half years. They got the best teacher ever known to man. And yet, when the crunch time came, they were out, out of town. They left. They quit. Important lesson there, which goes to what we're going to get to here. Number three, they had no idea what the future held. You're telling us we're fishermen, tax collectors, failed you less than uh, two months ago, and now you're telling us, no, you're in charge of world missions. Go out there and tell everyone who I am. But start in Jerusalem, then Judea, the province, and then go to the hated Samaritans that the Jews had no dealings with. And then on top of that, go to the whole world and tell them who I am. How am I going to do that? I couldn't even stay and loyal when, when, when he got arrested. So there was, there was just a total mess going on in their minds and their hearts. So then what happened? They went back to Jerusalem. Then what happened? How was this fulfilled? So Acts 2, 
verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, Pentecost was one of the three feasts that all Jewish men had to come to Jerusalem to observe uh, religiously. So people were from not just around all of Israel, but outer areas where Jews had migrated. Uh, they were coming from what we now call Turkey, Northern Africa, Cyprus, uh, going east toward Iran and, and Iraq, what we call Iran and Iraq. So, so they're from all over the world, Jews, celebrating the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost is not a word to use, Pentecostal and all that. That's not a, a biblical word. It's a Jewish feast. But they were all gathered there, just so happened on that 50th day after Passover, they were all together in one place. Let's just stop there for a second. That sentence is important. Why? God's about to make a visit. But notice they were all together in one place. It's very important that we gather as much as we can in one place. Like right now, we're gathering. Hebrews tells us, don't forsake the gathering of yourselves. It's very important. When people stop coming to church, whether it's you or me, it's always a bad sign. When you're healthy spiritually, you want to be with God's people. I'm not hearing much love coming back up here. Is my microphone on? Okay, good. So they, he says that they, they were gathered all together, but not only in one place, they were all together as in unified. They weren't fussing and fighting they were in one place at one time. And I want to say something to you watching online who live right here in the city environs. And uh, you watch on, 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 um, on your computer, on your phone. You watch online the meetings. Stop it. Come and be with us. We miss you. Congregation, do we miss them? Come on, let's say we miss them. So sometimes there's physical reasons. I got that. But the Bible says that the greatest things that you can imagine happen when God's people come together and are in one place. We need each other. Don't you get blessed by hearing other people singing and praising God? How many do? Say amen. So, very important. And I'd like to point one thing out to you here before we move on. In Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, it says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. When that was written... When you met together, you could be arrested and thrown in prison or killed as a Christian. And yet the writer has the audacity to say, don't forsake assembling yourselves. You would think he'd say, listen, the coast is not clear. Things are very hot out there. It's fire out there. So we're going to quit gathering together. No, even at the risk of arrest. And physical harm, he says, no, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves as the habit is of some. So we don't have that kind of persecution right now. There's no excuse we can't gather. I know some of you are saying, you know, COVID, COVID. There are COVID reasons and those are real. But a lot of you, we saw you in Macy's shopping. We saw you. Do I get an amen? Yeah, we saw you up on the second floor looking. Yeah, Polo, I saw you up there. Um, so no, that's for real. A lot of people just make excuses. You get lazy spiritually. Come on, let's talk real. Let's not do fantasy talk. You just get lazy. Oh, I'll watch it. And here. But for other things, you're active. You're running around all kinds of things. So don't forsake. I'm not saying that. God said that. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. So they were all gathered together in one place. Imagine people who were lazy and didn't go that day. Because they had been 10 days off and on meeting together, men and women. J Jesus' mother was there. There were 120. There were older people, younger people, no generational prejudice, no gender bias. Everybody was all together in that one place. And then suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. So notice, the sound something came from heaven. Listen to me now. I'm going to be direct here. So something came from heaven. That means it's a visitation from God. God is everywhere. I got that. 
Where two or three are gathered, there's a special sense that Jesus is here. But then there are some times where God says, no, they need a divine visit from me. And this is what happened here. The Holy Spirit, who Jesus sent, remember the Father sent Jesus. He was here for 33 and a half years. He accomplished his purpose. He went back to heaven and he said, I'm going to send you another helper, the Holy Spirit. We live in the era, not of Jesus on earth, but the Holy Spirit invisibly running the church and helping us do the work of the Lord. Wherever the Holy, without the Holy Spirit, Christianity is helpless. Because it's not by might or power or computers or apps or intelligence or, or all those other things. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, the Lord says, I will accomplish things. And now to give birth to the church, he starts it not with a teacher or a preaching series. He starts it with a visitation. Well, of course, the Holy Spirit comes. Notice, and they all saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Okay, so now they saw hard imagery from the Greek in that part of what it look, actually looked like. But there were 120, they were sitting, they weren't standing or kneeling, they were sitting. And the Holy Spirit, uh, as he came like a mighty rushing wind and this visitation came, a tongue, in, a, 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 a supernatural tongue, as it were, a fire shaped in the shape of a tongue came on each one of them. Not just the apostles, not just the leaders, not just the men, everyone, every woman, every man, because everyone in the church needs divine visitations. Every one of us needs to do what God wants us to do. We need to be visited by God, equipped by God, inspired by God, quickened by God, filled by God, the Holy Spirit. So every place that, uh, where they were sitting, it rested on them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and ba began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. What does that mean? It's called glossolalia, speaking in tongues. And in this case... Uh, because it was the day of Pentecost and all the temple area was filled with all these worshipers from all over the place, they heard this noise, possibly of the mighty rushing wind, or, uh, and they also heard them. Uh, the, the Greek picture is this. They were speaking in other languages in a kind of ecstasy, and they were so happy as they were speaking that others who came by thought they were drunk. And God did that. I wonder how many of us would sit still for that. We're so uptight and conscious of our image, uh, losing consciousness and letting God take control so that you're speaking languages you don't even know. For a lot of us, that's not our cup of tea. That's unfortunate for us because that's what God had them do when he started the church. Very, there's a fear in all of us to really let go and have God have his way. That's even true in, in hypnosis, why some people are very hard to hypnotize, because they will not yet let go. They are not susceptible. Even uh, people um, are, are afraid of taking, I'm one of them, uh, afraid of taking anesthesia. Because I have this thing in me What's going to happen once I go out? <laughs> Haven't you ever thought of that? Yeah, so I'm not one for that. I, I had arthroscopic surgery years ago from playing a lot of paddle ball, and they had to put me out for that. Oh, I was not a happy camper. So these people just got abandoned to God, and the Holy Spirit came, and it drew a crowd. But when the crowd came, some said, Yo, these people are drunk. Others said, well, wait a minute. They're speaking in our languages from where we come from. But how could they? They're a bunch of locals. They're fishermen. They, they've never went to schools. They don't know languages. But here we find them praising God and speaking of the greatness of God in our language. How could this be? What does this mean? Others, as I said, said, now nah, they're drunk. Peter stood up. 
And when he saw a crowd, the rule to them was, anytime a crowd gather, that's a chance to preach the good news of Jesus. So he stood up and went, whoa, whoa, time out. They are not drunk. How could they be drunk? It's nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is that which was prophesied and foretold by Joel in the Old Testament, your own scriptures, guys. In the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. My sons and daughters, young men, old men, dreams, visions, prophecy. That's what I'm going to do. Paul, Peter says, this is what's happening right now. That's what this is. And then he turns and he preaches a gospel message to the crowd. And it's simple. Well, listen, this is the point of the story. Is the guy's a fisherman. He just denied the Lord less than two months earlier. But he preaches a sermon, 5,000 get converted. So 3,000 get converted. And he's not looking for your ability. Don't you get it? He's God. He wants our availability. He wants us to open up and say, God, here I am. Come. Well, I didn't grow up that way, Pastor Simba. Well, what would that matter to me or, or you, how I grew up? We're not interested how you grew up and how I grew up or what this group says or that group. We're, we're supposed to go by the Bible. All in favor, say aye. aye. So this is what the Bible is telling us happened. So thousands joined the church and get baptized. And the church era begins with a visitation from God. God visited the place. They remember that day. But notice this. They never went back or talked about the upper room anywhere else in the New Testament. You know, some people get wrapped up in places. Oh, that's a sacred place. There are no sacred places. This building's not sacred. One day God's going to burn it all up like the rest of the earth. And there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. God doesn't dwell in buildings. God doesn't dwell in altars. God dwells wherever people call upon him and say, oh God, I need you. That's where God comes, amen? So there's no sacred cathedrals, altars. We don't have to make a pilgrimage anywhere. Just make a pilgrimage with your heart to God. That's the pilgrimage. So the church begins. So with a visitation from God. God came upon his people, men and women. And everywhere they went, they just told people about Jesus. That's how the church was born. No organized clergy, no degrees, no Bible seminar schools or seminaries. Just let's get it on. God has chosen the foolish things of this world, the weak things. That really hurts our pride. But that's what the book says in 1 Corinthians. God has chosen the weak things of this world to confound the powerful. When I spoke and the singer sang at the National Prayer Breakfast a few weeks ago, uh, and I met the president, the vice president, all these people, it struck me as I was there, and I say this respectfully, as you're around the, you know, the powers that be, the senators, Congress people, they have no power compared to Jesus. They, you know what? They're just people. They're just people who need the Lord themselves. And you know why? They can't change one human heart. No Democrat, no Republican, no anybody can change one human heart. But we can present Jesus and see lives change. So what happened was... Week, days or weeks, certainly couldn't be more than months later, Peter and John are going to the temple. And there they see this guy, lame, laying outside the temple near the beautiful gate. And he's over 40 years old, and he's never walked. And then a strange thing happens, supernatural thing happens. Some word of faith or word of knowledge or some anointing from the Holy Spirit directs Peter and John to stop at this one guy. There's beggars everywhere, and they're crippled and blind or whatever. They don't go to them. They go to him. And he's looking to get something. And Peter senses something from God, obviously, and says, look at me. 
The guy looks up thinking to get something. He says, I, silver and gold I don't have. But what I have, I'm going to give you. In the name of Jesus, get up. And he takes him by the hand and he lifts him. And through the power of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, the man begins to walk and the place goes nuts. Everyone knows who he is. He was a regular. And now they're shouting and he's jumping around and, and, and Peter and John are watching. And now people come running from other parts of the temple area. It was a large area. And they form a crowd. When a crowd comes, I'm going to preach. So Peter says some interesting things. He says, as the crowd is marveling, like how did Peter John do that to that guy? He says, hey, 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 hey. You think by us we have some power to do this? You think that through our only godliness and that we live perfect lives we were able to do this? No, no, no. It's through Jesus. It's through the power that's in his name. Shout Jesus from the mountain. It's power and it's the faith that comes through Jesus that we were able to do this. And you see this man jumping around. Well, thousands more get converted that day through that sermon. And look at the sermon. Study it when you're done here. Tell me if it's some work of art, of orat oratorical skills. No. The guy's a fisherman. This thing has really gone sideways, I'm afraid. Our whole concept of Christianity is based more on the intellectualism of the culture than it is in faith in the Bible. People all, I don't know enough verses. God can't use me. I didn't go to seminary. I didn't do this. And where would you find that in the Bible? With God, nothing is impossible. So, so... Now this crowd is gathering. Peter's preaching. He's preaching about the resurrection. He's preaching about the name of Jesus. And the religious leaders hear about it. I'm almost done. And they rush in to where he is. They stop him from speaking. They arrest him. The temple guard gives him a whack. They take him in, uh, to jail overnight. And this is the first overt persecution of the Christian church that we have in the Bible. Peter and John are in the slammer overnight. The next day, they pull them out. They bring them out before the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders. And the religious leaders say, <laughs> Peter handles it. It says, Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, answered them. So they go, by what authority and how did you do this? In other words, they couldn't deny it was done, but they're not going to go along with it. Imagine how stubborn we can get. They saw a miracle right in front, but they still were going to fight the name of Jesus. Imagine people here. You're, you're, you're not a Christian. You won't serve the Lord. And yet you, you hear the testimony of all the singers and ourselves that Christ has changed our lives. Come on. How many had life has been changed by the power of Jesus Christ? You see all these hands? And yet you won't believe. That's what's going to bring guilt on you and judgment. That although you sat here and heard all of this and you saw the lives that were changed, you, you don't, it's not you can't believe, you refuse to believe. Like them, they refuse to believe. So Peter and handles it well and says, oh, are you calling me to account for a good deed done to a man? Did we break, a, uh, break the law by helping him? So they warn him, hey, listen, don't speak anymore in that name. Didn't we tell you no more Jesus in Jerusalem? No more speaking about Jesus or, or, or about uh, the resurrection of the dead. Well, before they part, they make a strategy. They bring them in again, and then they say, all right, look, I for we forbid you. Remember what happened to your leader, you know, this Jesus? Remember what happened to him, how he ended? Yeah, well, that could happen to you. That's the implication. And they sent them on their way. Do not speak the name of Jesus. That's the same what's happening in America now. It's not hostile yet like back then, but it's growing. You can speak of the worst abnormal perversion. Everybody buys into it, right? You can have the weirdest kind of fetishes or every kind of thing. Everyone will say, no, that's the way she does and he is. You can't even get political leaders today to define what a woman is versus a man. They will not answer. They will not answer. 
That doesn't bother them. Just say the name of Jesus. Ooh. All hell breaks loose. How many are not ashamed of the name of Jesus, though? Come on. We're not ashamed. So, here we go. They're let go, and you know where they go back? Good lesson for all of us. They go back to their people. Oh, you mean the people from their island or their country? No, when you become a Christian, the body of Christ becomes your people. Not your family. You respect your family. You love your family. But if your family are unbelievers, they don't understand what God is doing in you. They went back to the church, to a gathering. And then look what it says. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people. Oh, yes. And reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, the threats, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Okay, we're almost done, so listen. They go back, they tell the, 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 the church that was gathered there, so this is what happened, and they just warned us, you can't preach in that name. We kept you overnight, one night in jail. Next time, it'll be a lot worse than that. You can't speak. And what are they going to do? They did what they know to do with Jesus. And the Bible says, in the day of trouble, call upon me, and I will answer you. So they together lifted their voices. That's another thing some of us are not comfortable with, people lifting their voices in public prayer. We're not used to that. You're supposed to be quiet. The Bible doesn't say that. Bible says about worship, make a joyful noise. Amen? And here they prayed publicly out loud. That's not being charismatic or emotional or, or, uh, or trying to manipulate people. That's what the Bible says they did. And now, as they pray and honor God, they get to this last part of the prayer. Watch. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. In other words, God, don't let us be intimidated. You saw the threat. You see what they're threatening to do. And we're in Jerusalem where, where they crucified our master. But God, don't let us back up. God, enable us to keep telling them about Jesus with boldness. Not whispering, with boldness. Help us die to ourselves so we can be bold. Bold. Sinners are bold. Every, everybody's bold. Pol politicians and their followers are bold. And many times the enemy tries to make us cower and, and be afraid. So they pray, Lord, let us do it with boldness. And while we're doing it, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. In other words, as we work for you, work with us. God, as we're spreading your gospel, you've got to bear witness to the fact you are alive. Do things supernaturally. Heal someone. Do something somewhere in the name of your holy son, Jesus, so people will know this is not just some crazy religion. This is the truth. Jesus, the truth, the life, the way. So what was God's response? And now we see another visitation. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Couple questions. If they were filled where we just said in Acts 2, and Peter and all of them were there with the women, the whole church, why they have to be filled again? Why another visitation? Because they needed another visitation. Now listen. Growth is the main way that we become more like Christ. Daily growth. What Lynette was talking about. Every day you got to be in your Bible. Come on, please. You got to read your word. You got to trust God. And daily he teaches us lessons and we grow. Like a tree grows daily. A vine grows daily. But on top of daily spiritual growth... God has chosen to bless us with what I call divine visitations, visitations of God. Notice the place where they were praying was shaken. That's God. If while I'm talking today, this building starts to rumble, that ain't me, that's God. How many say amen? 
But remember, it's different than the first time. There's no cloven tongues of fire. It just says the building after they prayed was shaken. And then they went out and did the very thing that the enemy didn't want them to do. They got holy boldness from God. They spoke the word. They didn't care about their lives anymore. Why? Because the Holy Spirit had so invaded them, they didn't care anymore. Now, that's strange to a lot of you. A lot of us, when was the last time you could say the Holy Spirit visited you? It's gone out of style, not because it's in the Bible. We've just developed an anti-supernatural, anti-Holy Spirit uh, American Christianity. That's the truth. I'll stand here and debate anyone. I know what the Bible says here. So do you now. God still visits people. Why? Because we get stuck. We get jammed up. We're in trial. We're in tribulation. The church then, what, are they going to go ahead or are they going to back up? Are they going to give in to the threats or are they going to proclaim the word? God said, no, I see what you need. Woomph, here we go. And they're visited again. Now, some, I'm calling it a, 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 a visitation from God. Other people call it a filling. That's language uh, that's used in the Bible. Ephesians 5, 23, I believe. Keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, why would we have to keep on being filled? I thought once we're filled, we're filled. No, we need repeated visits from God. How many have found that in your own life? Others call it revival. What is revival, if you would come, Jamal? Revival is when things are dead or lukewarm, and you're going through the motions in your own life or in a church, and right now, Churches are closing at a record rate in America. So I would say the great need we have are not teachers or more Bible translations or no pr more praise and worship songs. I think we have enough of those. How about a visit from God? How about a re well, revival is when God takes something that's lukewarm or dying out and he, he just whoosh, fire, fire. And now people are changed. They get sensitive about sin like they were never were before. The Bible comes alive and now they have to read it. Who put that hunger in them? God, the Holy Spirit visited them. Now they're bold to speak about Jesus. Not because someone programmed them, discipled them, because God himself visited them. Listen, I plead with you. I plead with you. Don't base your religion on your relationship to people in a church. God is not dead, he's alive. My heart sinks every time I hear a report. Someone calls in, I want counseling with a pastor. Okay, we'll arrange it. And we're happy to counsel you. But no, it has to be Pastor Symbola. Look at me. How could I possibly help you compared to Almighty God? You don't need me. You need God. Come on, can we say a loud amen to that? Pastor Symbola. Oh my goodness, I need God. Some of you, know, I'm, I'm thinking of a verse in Hebrew. Some of you should be counseling and helping others and you've never grown up. You're still in need of this and that over and over. You're still in the first, second grade, but you've been serving God for 25 years. When are you gonna move on? When are we gonna move on? So, I'm not saying that to condemn you. I'm preaching to myself here. I need God. I need visitations from God. Call it revival. Call it uh, repeated fillings of the Holy Spirit. Call it whatever you want. Call it, and God came and fell on them. Our church exists today, and people visit us. Maybe someone's here, a first-time visitor. Not because I'm a great orator. We talk to enough people. Not because the singers are the greatest singing group, but this is the most beautiful building, or we're in the nicest neighborhood. No, people are hungry for God. And they hear reports that you beautiful people worship and you don't care and you just hang out to God and you weep and you, you, you cry out to God. That's what people are hungry for. That's why this is so important. But as the singers come behind me, let me just close by saying this. We, we, we have to have visitations from God. When was the last time some of you have never had one? All you know is Christianity by the numbers. 
You can't even look to a day where you say, whoa, God meant me. That's not emotionalism. Don't buy that. You just heard the scripture. We need repeated fillings. We need repeated visitations from God. Are you with me? We need repeated revivals. We need revival. So, when Carol and I came to this church, there was less than 15 people. Less than 20. There was less than $5 in the bank account. We were in a rundown building. Bad things had been going on in the church in previous years. The pastor who previous, who, who was before me, he was a good guy. And he left. I think that the work had beat him down. And uh, it was just hard. Some strange people in that building. But now here we were. I was a total novice. Inexperience is not even the word. I didn't go to seminary. I was a basketball player. I wanted to shake and bake you, not preach to you. So, second week, I think it was. It's a Sunday night, and I get up to speak. 11, 12 people, 13, whatever. I get up to preach. I had some pitiful notes for a pitiful sermon. It was dark. I got up and started, and I started to stutter, and I started to like choke up like someone was almost strangling me. So, look, I was still playing ball then, working out. I was like, yeah, let, I'll, I'll rumble with this, but no, this was, this was something else. It, it was a darkness over the congregation. Congregation, 13 people. I tried. God knows he's listening to me now. I tried. And then, excuse me, I got emotional like I am now because I broke down in front of the people because I, I stopped. I realized this sermon is not the answer. I'm not the answer. Carol was on the organ. Something's really wrong here. And I broke down. And I said to the people, something is really off here. And I'm their new pastor. I had been told before that pastor left, someone was stealing money from the offering. Pitiful offerings, $85. But one of the people handling the offerings was stealing money before it could be counted. So I said to the people, you know what? Something's really wrong here, and I don't know what to do. I know I'm your new pastor, but something is really dark and wrong in this place. And I don't know what to do, but if you want to come to the altar and you want to pray, we need God. I don't know what to do. This church, my mother-in-law at that time had been telling my father-in-law, who was the overseer, close it up. Close it up. There had been some bad things in the previous years. Close it up. And my father-in-law said, no, let Jim and Carol give it a shot and see. You know, they're downtown Brooklyn. It's a rundown building and all of that. But, but, but no, let them try. Let's see what God will do. My mother-in-law was adamant. No, shut it down. My father-in-law had his way, and here I was. I called the people forward, and we just started to, what, like, what we're going to do now? Like, oh, God, would you please come and visit us? That's why this sermon means so much to me. I couldn't teach my way out of that. I couldn't organize. Organize, there were no people. I couldn't spend my way out of it. There was no money. There was nothing. And as we waited on God and sang a song like we're going to sing, God began to come, and I know he encouraged me. He met me that night, and I went home, and I wasn't totally discouraged. I had, like, hope. God is alive because he visited us. The building didn't shake. There weren't cloven tongues of fire, but God came and did something. How many, how many have ever had God come and do something in your life where you know that's God? No, that's God. That's not emotionalism. Nobody manipulated me into that. That was God. And then the next week went, and then every couple weeks or months, 
We couldn't exist unless God came and visited us. Now we have worship and praise and God has visited us already in this service, has he not? But we need more. You need more. God's talking to some of you. You need to open up and let God come in and visit you in a way, a profound way. He will shake things up in your life, but it'll be all for the good. He will bless you and use you. Habits that have been broken. Are you kidding? I can't teach you out of a habit, but God can break it in a second. A lightning strike. A lightning strike. If my wife and I believe in anything, it's that God comes and he visits his people. And I don't want to be a famous pastor. I don't want to be anything. I don't want to meet anyone. I don't want money. I, don't want, I just want people to come in here and leave and say, you know what? God was in that place. Did you know that God was in that place? I don't know who that preacher was. The singers were good, but I, God was in that place. I met God there. Don't we want that more than anything? Because in the end, we're going to meet God. Why can't we meet him now? We have to wait till we die. I know then we're going to see him face to face. Let's all stand. Lift that keyboard up. Don't move now. Just get ready to sing with us. We're going to sing all the glory of your presence. We, your temple, give you reverence. And while we sing that song, if you feel like, Pastor, that message was from me, I'm a candidate for God to visit me. Come out of your seat and just stand here in the front. But let's all sing loud. Lift the band up, please. Everyone. Oh.
nombre, Señor. Gloria a tu nombre, Señor. Oh, gloria a tu nombre, Señor. We praise you, Lord. We bless your name. close on Tuesday why don't you join with me I'm gonna fast you can fast one meal three meals fast I'm only saying that to try to encourage you and come to the prayer meeting even if you've never been to it before he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him let's ask him for greater invasions greater visitations so that his name might be praised When you leave, remember the offering which we've prayed for. We're going to sing up here for a while. You want to stay and sing? Do it. If you have to leave, you can leave. Sing it with us.
What's your name? Danielle. Very nice, Danielle. Wasn't that beautiful what she was doing last time? You handed me this and I got scared. I thought it was alive. Is that your bag? That's your bag? Very nice. You may go down. Let's thank Danielle for blessing us. Turn to a bunch of people, give them a handshake or a hug. Come on, get home safely. See you Tuesday. Tuesday, remember the offering as you leave. Singers, singers, singers.